our final segment concerns the use of private security in a campus area neighborhood. A WPVI news report titled Concerned Parents Band Together Hire Private Security Near Temple University Campus and an Inside Higher Education article titled Temple Parents Hire Private Security describe the circumstances that led some parents of Temple Collegians to arrange for private security. Jennifer Hedberg, Massachusetts parent of a Temple University senior, was concerned about a noted rise in homicides in Philadelphia. In 2021, there were 562 murders in Philadelphia, up from 499 murders in 2020. 103 murders had been committed by March of this year, by March 15th of this year, a pace slightly higher than that of the record year of 2021. But it was the murder of Temple University student Samuel Collington that led her and other parents to contract with a private security force to patrol the neighborhood. The Temple University Police Department stated that, with respect to the private security firm's patrol, quote, we want to help and support their efforts in any way we can, unquote. Neither Inside Higher Education nor WPVI interviewed any longtime residents of the area or residents of nearby neighborhoods, so we do not know if they are welcoming to or wary of the private patrols. We do know that we can consider this development using Albert Hirschman's framework of exit, voice, and loyalty. Hirschman argued that customers or clients of businesses or social service providers have two possible responses when services decline or when prices rise. One response is to stop using that service provider, to exit. The other response is to complain to the service provider in hopes of motivating an improvement, to voice. Hirschman noted that customers or clients voice who dis whose dissatisfaction, uh, that is to say Hirschman noted that customers or clients who voice their dissatisfaction are providing the service provider uh, important information that could be used to address the problem. If a customer or client simply exits, that too is information, but it is not as empowering because the provider only knows there was dissatisfaction, but the cause of the dissatisfaction remains unclear. Hirschman further maintained that there is a difference in who responds when services decline versus who responds when prices rise. When service declines, the people most likely to exit are those who care the most about quality. However, when prices rise, the people most likely to exit are those who care least about the service. What this means is that if quality declines, the people most likely to extricate themselves from dependency on the service provider are the very people most likely to care enough about quality to complain to the service provider. Consequently, the exit of those who care the most can reduce the chances of quality improving for everyone by reducing the chance that enough people will complain to make a difference. Loyalty, the third element in the perspective, explains that people committed to a service provider tend to use voice rather than exit, at least initially. Indeed, people who are loyal are likely to threaten to exit before, before actually following through. A threat to exit is actually an exercise of voice. It is one possibly last-ditch effort to impress upon the provider that improvement is imperative. In contrast, people without loyalty to the provider are likely to exit without voicing any threat at all. Now, consider the rising gun violence in Philadelphia, a danger rising not only in the area around the Temple University campus, but throughout much of the city. Service providers might reduce the incidence of gun violence by conducting by-the-book investigations that result in arrest and conviction of perpetrators, which could remove offenders who might repeat their gun play and endanger others. Service providers, such as police officers, could increase patrols and could adopt or enhance community policing, an approach that, by building positive relationships between people in the community and other authorities, might increase the sense of community belonging enough to make potential perpetrators reluctant to use or threaten deathly violence. 
Alternatively, community policing might help trusted authorities learn enough, with time enough, to intervene before matters escalate to gun violence. It is not difficult to imagine additional strategies that could play a role in bringing down the incidence of gun violence and the homicide rate. But the strategies I mentioned, and all of the strategies one might imagine, require personnel, time, and commitment. All, therefore, require money and other resources. Now, taking that into consideration, in the Hirschman framework, the city is a service provider and safe streets are the service. And the student, their parents, and other city residents have two options. They can leave or they can complain. The college student's parents arranged for private security. So how might we think about this choice in the Hirschman framework? One way is to see the provision of private security as exit, and that those living in the privately patrolled area have extricated themselves from the city's monopoly on policing. But the exit is incomplete, for the Philadelphia Police Department remains responsible for law enforcement throughout the city, even in the neighborhoods being covered by this private security patrol. Thus, this partial exit means that this neighborhood will be more policed than other city neighborhoods. This means that the criminals aware of the heightened policing will likely move to other neighborhoods. Consequently, the parents willing and able to pay for private security for the, the college adjacent neighborhood in which their children live are probably lowering their children's exposure to risk. But they are simultaneously likely to be raising the risk of residents of nearby neighborhoods of exposure to violence. Now, make no mistake, we can easily understand the urge to take action to supplement the safety of our loved ones. And taking steps to increase their safety is not wrong. However, it is also true that one sociological implication of this response is to shift risks onto others. The overall risk does not necessarily decline, it just gets reallocated to other people, principally people less able to supplement their protection by hiring private security services. And this is an interesting implication of the exit, voice, and loyalty framework. Exit of public services is only possible when people have substitutes to which they can turn. In a society with a high degree of inequality, only some people or families have those options. In this case, it is likely that most city residents cannot afford private security, so they are at the mercy of whatever quality and level of services law enforcement officials can provide. While Temple University administrators have welcomed the provision of private security, neither news report mentioned a response from the City of Philadelphia Police Department. Be that as it may, Hirschman does warn of additional dysfunctions that may arise in light of his framework. He notes that some customers or clients may use voice to vocalize repeated demands, and some providers may prefer that those clients exit rather than have to repeatedly encounter the protests that they incite. So Hirschman notes, the lazy monopolist may rid himself of the voice of these customers. He can extend just to them especially high quality gold-plated service. The purpose would be to buy freedom to deteriorate. That is to say, freedom to let their, the services that they're providing continue to decline. Through Hirschman's framework, we can see beyond the scary reality of a college senior afraid to walk in their own neighborhood to the implications of individual self-protective actions on the prospects and risks of others. When we look more closely, we find that our fates are linked to, through the social world, linked such that primarily individual efforts at protection likely only shift the risk from one group to another and perhaps back again. Certainly, pursuing an individual strategy is understandable and well within anyone's human rights. Yet, we can also ask, is shifting the burden from one vulnerable person to another really the best that we can do? That's This Week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be back next week with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care.